ambassador and mixologist for Diageo's luxury portfolio. Um, and I, first, before we go any further, I do want to thank our sponsor, Tanqueray, for uh, all the lovely cocktails we have today. Um, and also, before anything goes on, our caps for making all the cocktails and putting them in the So thank you guys. Now, if you guys have not downloaded the Tales of the Cocktail app, I suggest you do so because actually there's a uh, place on there where you can actually rank your seminars. I expect only five. Um, but that way the Tales actually knows, you know, what kind of seminars you want to see for next year. So please download it. Also, if you're going to tweet about it or anything like that, our hashtag is uh, which school. Um, so please uh, utilize that. And then before we go any further, I just want to also make sure that um, I introduce my panelists and thank them for coming all this way to uh, talk to all of us and share their insights. Because i got to be honest with you, the, as I started getting to know them, I've known them all for years, many more than I care to uh, admit. Um, but also, I've just gotten to, to admire them more. So I'm going to give a quick introduction and give you a little more detail about each of them. So to my right um, is Alex Day, um, AKA Babyface, <laughs> the bartender. Um, <laughs> so many of you guys know him from, from his work behind uh, Death and Company, and we'll get to a little bit further about all the other accomplishments he's made. Next to him is uh, Jim, uh, Jim Kearns who's also an incredible barman who's worked behind and worked with some of the most influential bartenders of our time out of New York City. So it's a privilege to have him here. Um, <laughs> and then we have TJ Lynch, um, who's an incredible barman as well. His career, he's gotten to work behind some, some of the most influential bars, but also he's notoriously known for making the pickleback famous around the world. <laughs> and uh, sorry, I thought that was a good thing. But, all right, so, uh, and then on the end, we have uh, Bobby Eugle, um, who can be quite controversial on Facebook sometimes. But that's why we love him. He's always sticking up for the little guy. And um, also, but he also, he's the man, I, I like to claim, he's the man who created the downtown Houston bar scene. So thank you very much. <laughs> so just to give you a little more information about why I chose these particular gentlemen, um, and they're gonna talk a lot, we're gonna talk about today about their mentors, who influenced them, how they got to be where they are, some of the practices that they have put into place in their own bars, uh, and things that they're looking, you know, they're continuing to do as they open other bars along in the future. So some practices they've left behind, some they've, they've adopted to keep up with what's going on in our society today. Um, and you can decide for yourself if it's good or it's bad. Um, so starting with Alex, uh, the one thing you should know about Alex, and I we did call him Babyface because he, when he worked, in, he started in the industry as a bar back when he was in NYU. Um, and during that time when he came out, uh, Death and Company opened. Um, I'm giving the short story. Uh, Death and Company opened around the corner, and he went in there, he told me, for six months, begging uh, Dave Kaplan, who's now his business partner, to give him a job. Um, eventually got a job there, and then four years later, in 2006, you became a partner. Am I right on that? Um, and then from there, he actually, from there, they've actually gone on to open up a consulting company called Proprietors LLC, and move on to the West Coast, where they've opened some incredible successful bars, which I'll let Alex tell you about in a little bit. Um, and then we have uh, Jake, Jim Kearns. Now, Jim Kearns started in the hospitality industry back in 1993 in Arizona. Um, he then was going to uh, school. He came back and he was also, he cooked, he waited and bus tables. So TJ and you were both cooks at some point. Um, and then he moved out to New York where his first bartending job was in Balthazar uh, in 2002, a very notable bar where he kind of learned his trade while he was pursuing a, a career actually in a degree at Pratt University. Um, which he graduated, I'll have to say it with honors, just to give you a little bragging rights. Um, he also almost became a chef. He uh, became, uh, was going to go to culinary school, but also uh, he also trained as a professional chef. But in his tenure, and as many people, what happens to a lot of us, and I'm sure it's happened to many of you, as you guys went to school, you planned on doing something else, and then you started working at a bar, and you fell in love with the bar world, and next thing you know, this is your career. And isn't that amazing? 
and like that's where all of us got, got into this industry. So from there, he actually started working with people like Sasha Petrosky and Audrey Saunders and uh, making sure Leo Robichek from the, from the Nomad Hotel and many, many others. And now he actually owns an incredibly fun bi-level bar called The Happiest Hour and downstairs is Slowly Shirley. And if you haven't been there yet, when you come to New York, you definitely need to check it out. Because it is awesome. All right, and then we have TJ Lynch. TJ is also somebody who is uh, training to, and his crew. <laughs> he comes with his own entourage. Um, <laughs> so um, they, they must have really liked the pickleback. Um, so he's been in the hospitality industry for over 20 years. He started his career in Baltimore MD also as a chef and a co-owner of the Red Maple. Um, this is where he met a gentleman named Hilary Hogarty. And Hillary was a 47-year-old man in the bar world. First person to give him influence about being a bartender was a great job. He was the first person he met at that time. Um, and then he came to New York where he began bartending and managing and consulting for lots of different bars. And also he met another gentleman, Toby Maloney. And then he went on to open his own bar, Mother's Rune. And he's about to open up another bar, out in, two more bars out in Williamsburg. But his bar is the bar all the bartenders hang out in after we all get off our bars. So um, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. And then uh, at the end, uh, Bobby Eugel is, as I like, he likes to describe as the working bartender and the operating partner of Anvil Bar and Refuge. Um, but you have many things that go for your name. But um, that is where it takes his pride in. Uh, also, the Pastry Wars in Houston, Texas. He's also the co-owner uh, co of the Clumsy Butcher. Um, a restaurant and bar administrative company with partnerships in restaurants like the Underbelly, Beer Bar, Hay Merchant, Coffee Shop, Blacksmith. I go on and on and on, but now about eight bars. And he did that all, what, at the age of 24? I'm 32. Yeah. <laughs> he was very young. But um, so thank you again, gentlemen, for uh, joining this panel. Make sure my clicker is working. Uh, you have to actually turn it on. All right. So I meant to do that while flipping through pictures, and I did not. So, uh, <laughs> so I won't repeat myself, but if you want to write down their hashtag, there you go. Uh, so Alex, uh, Jim Kearns, there you go. TJ Lynch, you get to see them in person. All right. And Bobby, and all his bars, which is absolutely amazing. So let's talk about our mentors and where we started out. So on the East Coast, and I'm sure in every one of your cities, there's been a mentor that's kind of inspired you. Um, being in New York, we've had the privilege of kind of working with some of the mo most famous people that everybody has heard of at this point. Most notably, we all know Dale DeGroff. And I'm sure you've seen him here. Uh, if you haven't, he's always out and about in New Orleans. He's one of the most influential people. He's the reason, I always say he's the reason why the cocktail scene was created in the first place. As you all know, he started off in the 80s, the Rainbow Room, started doing incredible uh, cocktails there, and just pushing the envelope. And he was my mentor, and he's been the mentor to many of them, and inspiring us to always go for better, and also fresh juice. Whoever thought that had to be a novelty, but now it's becoming, it's something that's in every bar you're finding out there, which is incredible. Um, next to him, I'm sure you have no introductions, Audrey Saunders. Now, Andre is a woman, she actually was taught by Dale DeGroff, if you've never met her in person. So they worked together at Blackbird, where she really, she had met him because he was giving a seminar, and she really wanted to work with them. So she used to work for free, wherever she could with him. And then she got to work with him at Blackbird. She went on there to the Bellman's Bar, and then she opened the very famous Pagu Club. Many people here are from, you know, have been at one point influenced by the Pagu Club, and a lot of teachers like Jim Meehan came from the Pegu Club, and uh, Phil Ward, or Maya Welcome, the uh, Toby Maloney, which we're gonna talk about, um, came from the Pegu Club. So a lot of people that are now in our industry are now famous, they all came from that one school of thought. Next thing most people will recognize is Sasha Petrosky. <laughs> now Sasha is somebody that is definitely quite interesting, and I actually just wanted to read something um, that was actually written by Paul Clark because it was a very good description of who Sasha is, and I didn't want to take away from it. So Paul Clark uh, actually writes Sasha as being one of the most influential persons um, at the dawn of the 21st century, when Cosmos and Jaeger shots was still the drink of choice. Sasha Pogrowski sparked a classic cocktail revolution when he opened the members only speakeasy Milk and Honey on New York's Lower East Side. Since then, dozens of speakeasy style bars have cropped up across the country, and Brachowski has built a mini empire. So nobody could say it better. I think it kind of sums up him right there. And the gentleman on the bottom is Toby Maloney. 
Now, not everybody knows Toby, but he has influence. When I was talking to a lot of these gentlemen up here, he had an influence on them. He used to work with Sasha. He worked at Milk and Honey. He worked with Audrey. He consulted at the bar where uh, TJ used to work. He taught Jim Kearns here quite a few things and has been influenced on a lot of people uh, in this room. So he's definitely something that's very notable in our cocktail world. So now that we know who the, the, the starters, I want to get to each of my guests. So starting with you, Jim, I want you to just kind of take us through like who these people are, like what their influence were on your career. Like three things you took away from each of them. Uh, I, I never actually worked with uh, Dale, but um... I sort of dumb lucked my my way into a, uh, a job where I got to train with uh, Sasha when he was consulting on the original Double Seven uh, in the Meatpacking District in 2005, and uh, he taught me. I mean, I, I credit him with with teaching me the majority of what I know about making cocktails. Um, I worked at Double Seven for about nine months a year, something like that, and uh, around that time, Pegu Club was opening, and I really, I kind of wanted to move on and get more serious about the cocktail uh, aspect of bartending, and um, I was super interested in working with Audrey and moving on to work at Pegu, and uh, that's how I kind of ended up there. I just sort of uh, kept, you know, nagging and begging anyone I could possibly get a reference from. Well, Jim, then, can you uh, give us a little bit, sorry to cut you off, a little bit of like the technical things. I know you said very specifically, like at Sasha, at seven, Double Seven was very different from any of other Sasha's bars, where it was a club. Right, uh, it, I, I mean, mean Sasha, yeah, Sasha taught, yeah, me, Sasha taught, taught me how to free pour, so I, you know, that's uh, <laughs> And free pour is not something you see in a lot of the classic cocktail bars. Yeah, I, Double Seven was owned by the same ownership group that uh, owned uh, Lotus, which was a club across the street. And being a club ownership group, they were a little nervous about the whole jiggered cocktail um, build and service time. So <clears throat> the compromise that they arrived with, uh, arrived at with Sasha as their consultant was that essentially uh, everything had to be built uh, using jiggers, but then the spirit could be free for it, the base spirit could be free for it. Um, so we went through weeks and weeks of rigorous uh, free pour testing. And that, to this day, that's how I start training bartenders because it just it helps people to understand kind of the accuracy that you can get with, uh, with either method and uh, how valuable jiggers are when it comes to building cocktails. Um, how about ice? Ice definitely. I mean, we had block ice. We had a uh, we had one of the first, I think, uh, cold draft machines to come to New York. Um, it was an air cooled cold draft, so it broke down about yeah. <laughs> Alex, Alex takes a deep breath. It broke down about once every three days, um, and you know you can only buy them at that time, so it was just broken when it was broken. Um, Meaning we were borrowing a lot of ice from Lotus, but we also had block ice, and you know, Sasha's whole method is very you know sort of long division. You know, you, you build everything before you add ice and around, uh, and then you kind of um, ice and uh, shake and stir very strategically from there. And but, what's the difference between him and Audrey? Like when you went to Audrey? Well, when I started at Pegu. Um, I quickly learned that volume was a factor uh, sometimes when <laughs> making cocktails. And if you were working the service box at Pegu on like a Friday night, say, uh, you would have anywhere from 10 to 20 service tickets with five to 10 drinks on each of them in front of you pretty much all night. Uh, and uh, the thing that Audrey taught me that I thought was most valuable was kind of like where you could take shortcuts and when and still not compromise quality uh, in, in terms of service or cocktails at the end of the day. What's an example? Uh, she taught me that if you're, for instance, if you're making a single stirred drink, crack your cold draft, ice the mixing glass, and pour the ingredients over the ice. And, and you, you are already accomplishing chill and delusion, which are your two goals uh, in in making a cocktail, essentially. So uh, that was that was a huge lesson to learn after coming from the strict sort of ice last uh, school of bartending. 
So difference in, so yeah, ice light, because that's what we were always taught, ice last. So yeah. you put ice first to, to change the dilution. Uh, it, it just, it, if you're making one stirred drink, there's no reason, you know, you're, you're not losing anything as long as you don't delay between ingredients and you actually make sure the drink is stirred and goes out on time. Now, you also have in there, so I'll, I'll, I can back and, and Toby, what did Toby teach you? Toby taught me uh, <laughs> quite a bit. The bar, um, Toby taught me. Um, <laughs> Toby is behind the they bar. They laugh because if you very met Toby. <laughs> behind the bar, Toby taught me. Um, <laughs> Toby is to this day one of my favorite people to uh, eat and drink with. He's a mentor. I, I love the guy. Um, but the biggest things that he taught me uh, when I first started at Pegu were uh, anything that you can do with one hand, you should be able to do with the other hand. Um, so become ambidextrous as soon as you possibly can. Uh, and anything that you can do with two hands, you should be able to do with one. Uh, so basically, like if you can open a bottle with two hands, learn how to do it with one. Uh, do everything you possibly can to cut every little nanosecond of time out of your drink. Uh, and that was kind of the biggest thing. To how to double shake. And most of the flair that Toby does, honestly, is very functional. Uh, and he, he also right, taught so me how to TJ, double shake. I mean, which is one of the most valuable by. things in the world as a bartender. <laughs> we didn't have a picture of Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so I mean, TJ, he told me what he you were also like, influenced so I by. I <laughs> we didn't have a picture of Hillary. So. <laughs> I mean, I, he told me what he kind of looked like, so I so, imagined uh, I looked one up. So a cartoon, I thought would be best. Yes. What? Yeah, <laughs> they're markedly close. Yeah. So uh, TJ, tell us, you know, what you learned from Toby and or from Hillary first, Hillary, then from yeah. Hillary Hogarty was a 45-year-old bartender in Ellicott City, Maryland, where like. The only reason you either bartender or serve in that area is because you're derelict or you can't get another job or you're fired from your real job. Or, you know, and, and, but he was the only one that took it seriously, like, that I've ever met like, in Baltimore at all. You know, he was 45, he'd been in AA for six years, yet still bartending, still wearing a vest, a tie, apron, when the rest of the staff just wore a t-shirt and jeans. He took it so seriously, and it just blew my mind. Um, yes, and then he, you know, with him, it was an actual job. It was all about like, you actually, <laughs> give a shit. This is great. His bar was um, Yes, and then he, you know, with him, it was, um, it was all about like, he would maintain your air. His bar was like, immaculate at all. Every little everything lined up, everything clean. From the like, he, he would re replace people's wet napkins constantly. He like, like, every little piece of the bar was Toby perfect. Just me to From not the minute he started his shift, to the minute he <laughs> 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 Toby just taught me to not give a shit about what anybody else does. And if you're a man, you understand that. Like, it, it is a, I actually don't give a shit what anybody says, and you go in there because... And if you've ever been to that mother's room, you'd understand that. Like, it is a, you don't give a shit what anybody says, and you go in there because of that. That's why everybody hangs out there, because there, you don't feel any pretense. So, uh, Toby broke the mold, and so did TJ. And he, uh, I, I definitely work it forever, and then uh, he would sub in there. <laughs> And then that, he's like, two right, years so later. Bobby, like, yours is a little different. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he still does uh, Wednesday night. Um, I didn't really have All right, any so Bobby, yours is a little different. Mentor. There's nobody <laughs> yeah. was making cocktails in Texas when we started doing it. Um, uh, I didn't really have any I actually used to come to cocktail my for, or mentors my because nobody was making cocktails in Texas when really we started cool doing it. Like, I actually... Um, I actually used to come to Tales. This is my first or my tenth Tales. And the first time I came to Tales, it was really cool because I got to actually so say I would like, different like words bring them that up I didn't know how to pronounce because the only time that I ever said them out loud, nobody knew the difference. Right? So then I would like kind of like bring them up in conversations around people and be like, okay, cool, that's how you say that. Right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, got it. Awesome. Thanks. You know the almond thing, right? So, um, so I guess like my mentors are people that I, I learned about cocktails from online, right? And I don't know if anybody else has that similar story. But like, if you didn't work in a major city that had cocktail bars or had, you know, people like all the people that we've heard talk about before, who definitely influenced me. But the way that you learned about cocktails was was reading the old Eagle Experience and Cocktail Forum or the old Drink Boy Forum that Robert Hess used to keep, right? Or when people started writing blogs like Paul Clark, you know, we would we would read about those different things, and those were kind of the ways that I got influenced. And Paul, especially, you know, he was he was writing about the stuff that was like fringe stuff on his blog that wasn't necessarily going to make it into your very formal New York Times piece. And while he writes wonderful formal things now, he was writing about 
different brands I've of Rittenhouse or oh, di different brands of Ride. It's how I learned about Rittenhouse and things like that at the time. And so then that meant that we got to go, oh, we should get some of these products into the state of Texas. And we encouraged distributors to bring them in and stuff like that, you know, and um, what those in the, the aviation debates that were happening back in the day and stuff like that. You know, that's how we learned about stuff in different markets when there was no one else that would actually act as a physical mentor. Um, like behind your bar and Jeffrey the same thing and Jeffrey was actually talking about bar management and talking about how to incorporate these things to, like behind your bar and, and his new book is just a further testament to that and I think goes down that path and then we really started with Robert Hess that was the first the first cocktail forums that were on the internet with the, the old MSN drink boy forums and everybody was on those forums and it was you know, only the, the dorkiest of cocktail people were, were on those forums talking about cocktails and reviving old cocktails. And, you know, I would just get online and, like, lurk and stalk those people and then slowly incorporate them into the nightclubs that I was working at, you know. And it was like, I'll just make drinks from, from 4 to 6 o'clock and try and serve a sidecar, you know. And, like, and then now, no more sidecars, so just, just Red Bull Walker. So, yeah. <laughs> There were a lot of chat rooms were cool. Yeah. 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 Perverts. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of perverts in those chat rooms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then All after, right. thank you. The other thing is the, uh, oh, so wait, uh, we before I get into it, Alex, so uh, but after you got into the cocktail world. world. Yeah, and then after, and that was the other thing, is that uh, we opened Anvil in March of 2009, and then I actually got to go to my first cocktail bars, like when I could finally afford to buy a plane ticket, and I went to New York. Right, and one of the I first bars I went to with Death Justin was Death and Company, and with right, and then we, we started going to some of these other New York cocktail bars, and um, I remember <laughs> Justin, who opened so Anvil with me, was like, well, make sure you go and take lots of notes so we can figure out how we're actually supposed to do this, and I was like, I got it, right? <laughs> so I went into all these bars, and I thought I was, like, going to, like, be exposed to, like, these magical things, like, somehow the last word just wasn't for ingredients you put in a cocktail and chicken strength, right? Like, it was somehow going to, like, speak to you or something like that, but what I did did learn was really, that really good stuff. It's like we were stuff. making cocktails correctly and it no, really isn't as fucking hard as everybody nice makes it out to be <laughs> right but the the really really good stuff is in the details right and you know i remember the first bartender i sat in front of when i went to new york city was joaquin senior right which is kind of like the most ideal story you can have there in that situation but then like also like more as we watched other people around the country and i and i lifted like alex and dave is because i think their their attention to details and that's really what running great bars is about have been like really big things that I've tried to take away, is, you know, when I do travel, and that's primarily how we get to learn things is by to traveling to other markets. And we have a great small community, but it is it's it's much smaller than the rest of the country. So it's important for us to to have mentors yeah, and people Julie, to look up to, you know, Julie's in other parts of the country. For, for what about I mentioned Julie Reiner as well. Yeah, Julie. I think Julie's <laughs> Julie's standards for for cocktail bars I think really inspired me. It's just everything is so consistent. We always have like a, a consistent experience every time you go in. And I think that that's, that's something that we try and do in our bars because we, we'll get into this a little bit later, I guess, but we don't, we don't have like a huge talent pool. There aren't people who have worked for other people. We have to train everybody. And so having, having standards and having that consistency is something oh, that we really uh, try and have in and our bars. Uh, I'm sorry? We're, oh, we're pretty anal oh, about what we do and don't carry in our bars. Oh, and then, uh, really then Thad Vogler from San Francisco, he, uh, I mean, we're, we're pretty anal about what we do and don't carry <laughs> in our bars and really like, care well, about the, the quality and the background of the spirits. <laughs> and he's more anal like than all of us, like right? <laughs> and I like him constantly like, well, do I want to continue to go down that path? And I always kind of use him as like someone to kind of measure where we're at with our bars and think about the, the quality of spirits and cocktails that we serve in our establishments. And I think he is definitely the person that has chosen to take that the furthest, right? And, and all the way down to this is the type of citrus that we have and we know where the citrus comes from and everything like that. And I think that that's been really inspirational to watch someone, you know, especially in the, in San Francisco where I think that they're a little more able to do that than we are in Houston. Um, the people in Houston who sell us lines are like, this is what you got, shut up. This, we're not going to to talk about other live options. You're really annoying, right? But like, um, I think it's, it's, it's a great measure for, for how far we can choose to have very, very strict and regimented standards for what we do carry in our bars, and that's uh, been really I, I think I'm probably a classic case of uh, All right, Alex, right place, right time, time in a lot of ways. Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I, I think I'm probably a classic case of uh, right place, right time in a lot of ways, um, and I've built a career out of it pretty much dumb luck. Um, when I got into uh, the cocktail industry, I'd been bartending for a little bit through college and 
cared about it, but only so much that it paid bills and was a lot of fun. And uh, I was then exposed right when Death & Co. opened around the corner for me and sat in front of Joaquin Simo, who changed my world and served me that first aviation. And, but what was really, I think, crucial about that time was it was the second sort of wave of what has happened in the modern sort of New York trajectory, right? Uh, Peggy was established, Milk and Honey was established, and this was the, like, the next step of some of those guys stepping out and saying, okay, can we have a cocktail bar that's a different form? And the kind of energy that came out of that was really, really exciting to me and really, uh, I think, tapped my interest in professionalism and, and like, a sense of history and, and making something with your hands and so I was very inspired by it but there was also not much going on so I was somehow able to pester them at Tuff & Co to give me a job Eben gave me a job somehow and without any experience whatsoever and able to rise very quickly and I think that speaks to the nature of the cocktail industry eight years ago right where a 24 year old could rise very quickly just simply by digging in and uh, that is largely because I think you know listening to these guys talk mentorship comes in so many different ways and there's one thing to take away from this entire conversation that most people in this room mentor other people like that's what hospitality industry is right so there's there's in the trenches mentorship where you're working next to somebody and they're teaching you an actual a lot of skill the that or are up to there, do something, to I not do something, and then there's the inspirational aspects of mentorship, uh, where a lot of the people that are up there, the I never worked for directly, I never worked for Audrey or Julie directly, uh, for instance, for but many, many years, they were... Um, to go to their bars was inspiring, and they, without them probably knowing it, mentored me for many, many years. And inspired a lot of the work that we do, so it's it's a powerful thing. On the more like in the trenches level, getting to work without while being totally green, starting at Death and Co. and working with Joaquin, Brian, Miller, and Phil Ward was amazing in how those three distinct personalities informed absolutely every decision that has been made in my career since. Joaquin, if you've been living on the moon and don't know this, he's the nicest fucking person on the planet, and it's authentic. He genuinely. I loves and cares and to deal with individuals and make them happy. Like and not in some contrived way of saying, things, oh, right? so I you know, put on a smile and make everyone happy because that's our job in hospitality. He like, like, genuinely cares. Myopic, that's fucking like, amazing, right? So learn to, to, to like care about the individual. From Brian, he like has this sometimes myopic like uh, attention to detail from that, that he's, he, like the blinders are on, but <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and and f from that, he he is able to create these these magical things that he is uncompromising about. And Phil, he, his cocktails, like just to speak about cocktails, he'll come up with a drink and you slap your head and you're like, how the fuck didn't I think of that? That's like that's so simple. Hot old fashioned, anyone? Like, come on, that's brilliant, right? And there's a a level of brevity to his his uh, creativity and ingenuity that is very inspiring, but it's all based upon the fact that he knows all of his products through and through to a degree that is expert level, right? And that is very, very inspiring. So those three guys together, like every each one of those is something that the, the level of passion comes across as a special organic type of professionalism that uh, I'm constantly failing to to live up to in every one of our projects. I'm sure you're not. Well, can you tell that I thought the most fascinating thing was the DNA of milk and honey Mm -hmm. um, versus the DNA of the Taylor from Evan Freeman. So Evan Freeman is a gentleman on the top right, if you don't know him. And Evan Freeman, to me, brought, he was one of the first people I ever met that did molecular mixology. Yeah. He doesn't like that well, word. He I know. But, he uh, no. Uh, so I don't know. He went to London and did molecular mojito. So, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, he pushed the envelope. <laughs> he definitely pushed definitely the envelope. Be, right. So tell the difference between like Death and Company and Taylor. So um, I think Death & Co. aspired in the beginning to be, um, to take a lot of influences from everything happening, um, heavily influenced from Audrey because everyone on the crew that was making decisions came from that camp. Um, and certainly Sasha's aestheticism and attention to detail was very important. Um, and then getting to work for Eben at the same time I was learning that classic, like, and rigid, like, you know what? this is what a Manhattan yeah, is, great. it's, and it's, we fuck with that? put it on a pedestal, it's like a religious experience, and Evan's like, you know what, 
10 years ago. Yeah, like, that's great. People know cocktails but already. Can we, we fuck with that? Surprise. Can we, we play with that? Can we play with people's expectations? And he was saying uh, well, 10 years ago, like, people know cocktails already. We should give them a surprise. We should give them something new, something to talk about, something to be, uh, to, to get excited about. And that level of what can't we do, what is possible, is, is something that I think as we dive, as cocktail bartenders or mentors or educators, we dive into teaching a lot of information and, and giving rules and what to and what not to do is an important check to say, well, we can, once we know this stuff, we can go. Absolutely. So right, before we go any further, I just want to, do you guys know what you're drinking? Uh, the first cocktail that came out was uh, a, a, uh, one of Alex's cocktail uh, old radio days, uh, made with Tanqueray Gin, um, Sales Gin Teen Aperitif, uh, lemon juice, acacia syrup, uh, and a little bit of Angostura bitters, and some sparkling wine. And the second cocktail coming out is actually uh, a, a drink called War Days. It's a uh, green chartreuse, bonded Applejack, sweet vermouth, and Tanqueray Gin. <laughs> Today is Jim. So. Um, <laughs> But, uh, so I just wanted to talk today? about it. So today is yours. Uh, <laughs> today is Jim's. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so I just wanted to talk about it. So now Alex, uh, most people, he went from being on the East Coast going over to the West Coast. And I was amazed to find that there was a trail from the East Coast to the West, especially going out in LA, um, of like how much Sasha influenced the West Coast. So I just wanted to talk about like how it started and then your path. Uh, there's a lot of Angelinos in this room. Um, Marcos right there is largely responsible for making good cocktails in Los Angeles a thing. Um, Go Marcos. Yeah, Marcos. Uh, there, I think just from observing and moving there late and being guided into the city by people like Marcos and our good friend Eric Alperin who owns the Varnish, um, there was definitely a trajectory and a moment when uh, Sam Ross came out and opened Comsa and taught some people who went on to uh, open a number of cocktail bars throughout Does everybody Sam Ross is? He's a man who made the penicillin. Yeah, all right. Worked for Sasha. He's, he's all right. Yeah. He's all right. <laughs> he's, he's, he's figuring it out. Um, and uh, so that really defined a lot of the L.A. cocktail scene was, was the Milk and Honey book and the, the sort of approach to cocktails, I think, largely, uh, for, for a lot of people. It's obviously a huge generalization because a lot of people are doing great stuff. Vincenzo over in Santa Monica. Um, well, as uh, Eric Alpern explained to me, he said, L.A. already knew cocktails, but there was no program. He said there was no official program, and then when, uh, when Eric came out, he came from the Sasha School, and they had the varnish had the very first program because nothing is official in our world and while something has a program and then from there things got started getting uh, inspired um, and started moving on from there and that's just another way of saying there was structure right you know yeah. like <laughs> there's somebody saying yes we will do that no we won't do that and putting it into a box and to see in since I moved to Los Angeles about oh god five years ago um, to see a lack of structure and some structure being put into place, uh, the culture of the city has transitioned into really embracing uh, not only those, those uh, giving any sort of shit about the details, but also really kind of putting it up on a pedestal and developing now very unique programs that are wholly Los Angeles. They're, they're unique in and of themselves. You could not take one of those bars and pop it in New York or Chicago, which is really exciting time. Like we. Um, came out with a book last year and traveled all over the country and visited all these bars and it was so cool to see all these cities that uh, there's a natural trajectory of like, okay, we'll do a kind of a New York style bar, a speakeasy or whatever it is, right? You reference some other place and now there's this level of identity in all these markets that is of place. That's so cool. Like that, is, I mean, we're past it being, cocktails being a, a nice little thing. This is now something that's everywhere and, and that's really, really I know, Bobby, that's a big thing for you, too. Like, a Houston bar is a Houston bar. Yeah, I think, our, bar in Houston. I think our bar scene benefited from the fact that it was somewhat developed within the city, you know, and that later on it reconciled itself by visiting other places and stuff like that, which I think is, again, an important part of mentorship, but I also think that it was always intended to serve Houstonians. And I think frequently we see cocktail bars intended to serve this vague idea of what a cocktail demographic is and I think that that's the wrong way to think about opening any bar cocktail beer dive whatever like you open a bar for the people that are around you and maybe it acquires national and international recognition and other people visit after that you know so absolutely so let's talk about some of the lessons you guys learned like you took away 
Um, what is the one behind the stick? One of the things that you hold like holier, like your holy grail when you're behind the stick that you took from one of your mentors that you still use today? I don't know. I mean, I, I, when I learned from uh, the old guys that taught me at Balthazar, I feel like I learned more about actually tending bar than I probably learned from any cocktail mentor. So, I mean, just hospitality and the role of a bartender as being someone who uh, curbs chaos, uh, welcomes guests, creates an environment, uh, gives service, uh, and, and generally just tailors an experience. Uh, I, I feel like I got more from those guys than uh, probably anyone else I learned from. TJ? Uh, Hillary's big thing was, you know, just controlling the room, controlling your bar. Uh, he always had this, he's, yeah, the head on the swivel thing. He said it like every day. He, he like hit me in my butt. He's like, head on the swivel. Like, I'm like, okay, all right. You know, so because, and, and if I didn't have something in each hand, he'd yell at me. It's like, you know, <laughs> so, so your eyes are always moving, your hands are always moving. You know, like never stay still, like, and just, and just be on it all the time. Bobby? Uh, if you sit at my bar, I will always ask you what your name is. I will commit your tab to memory, and I will ask you another random fact about your life every single time. And when you come back in, I probably won't remember your name, but maybe I will. But I'll probably remember the drink you liked, most likely, or at least I'll be able to say, how's your daughter, or something like that. So, Who'd you learn that from? Uh, this guy named Peter, who was someone I worked for for four months until he cheated on his wife, and then they split up the bar and closed the bar down. But I remember wow. that. Uh. Those three things have been with me ever since. <laughs> Alex, what is one thing you're old? That's awesome. Holier than now. Um, it's, it's similar to everything that they've said, um, and I can't believe I neglected to mention probably one of the most important mentors in bartending for me. It was a guy named Scotty, who uh, I was a bar back for him at a truly awful bar in the East Village <laughs> called The Musical Box, which is... Uh, oh, right? Yeah. It wasn't awful. Where is it? Uh, it's so it's you guys know Port and Ribbons, Joaquin's Bar. Uh, it was right next door to that downstairs, um, and that used to be a really nasty club. Yeah. Well, um, so uh, Scotty w had been a bartender at this bar for probably 10 years, and uh, he was a curmudgeon. It was fantastic. Like, as if we're setting up the bars, like these fucking people, they're going to come in, they're going to drink, and then as soon as the door opens, like, Scotty's on. And he's on and he's ready to have a really great time and not I mentioned Joaquin's authenticity um, and the opposite end of that is that when you're what I took from Scotty was that he knows when he's he's working and that you need to make sure that no matter what else is going in your, on in your life if you you know you cheated on your wife and you're breaking up the bar you know you, the bar is open you're serving people that there's an obligation there to provide something and it doesn't have to be like oh happy-go-lucky that there that there is a consistent mood that comes out of the bar and it, it just that really just underscores everything they've said anyway so awesome for repeating things <laughs> no, I couldn't help it I just love I had to google it took me a long time to find that picture but I just loved it so much uh, <laughs> um, so now we're talking about like some of the lessons you learned that you're now using from one of your mentors you're using like as a bar owner like a lesson learned from like one of your mentors you're now using as a bar owner instead of being behind the stick. You know some of you guys are still behind the stick. Yeah. Uh, like I said before, like the lesson I learned from Toby and that, that, we, that we all do every day at Mother's is to not give a shit about what anybody else thinks. You know, and just do it your way and, and own it. Yeah. Uh, Jim? Uh, I, just to try to maintain, I mean, this is something that I just, I've learned from everybody I've worked with to try to maintain uh, the highest level of service possible for any particular time or situation and to look out for everybody at my bar. Alex? I think I said it already, but the responsibility of mentorship um, as, as something yeah. that we, everyone, no matter what position you are within a hospitality venture, uh, you are teaching other people. That's the nature of this. It's Socratic, right? So you, that is, that is a very special thing. And you can, so often we repeat the same things over and over again and it just goes down the line, but you, 
you teach people, right? You're, they're going to internalize this because everyone's a sponge, especially if you're learning from somebody you respect, and, and that's incredibly powerful. And I remember the things working for Brian, Phil, and Joaquin, um, working with Jim, working with a number of people in those early days when I just wanted to learn everything that I think back at, and I'm like, wow, they probably didn't even notice what they said. It's the same thing as like being a teenager and having a traumatic event that like in retrospect is not traumatic at all. You broke up with your girlfriend, right? Not really that big of a deal. But that these things like become markers within your career or life and your personality and that and it's, it's something to consider, deeply consider. Most definitely. Bobby? I think the bars and the bartenders I really like around this country are people who have opinions. Like and they just like I, I really appreciate that cocktails are becoming more accessible and lowbrow. But I think at the same time, we're kind of removing some of the things out of bars that made them interesting in the, in the beginning. And I don't care if you're running a dive bar or a wine bar or a beer bar, or like whatever, just like have an opinion. And when I come in, I want to like almost somehow get to know the bar owner a little bit better through their bar and not feel like it's just been dumbed down to be as non-controversial as possible. So I think that in all of our places and in all the places that I admire around the country, there's like some goal or some opinion or some purpose for which that bar was built. And that's something that I always try and think about when we open a new place. Thanks. All right, so when you guys um, started, in addition to uh, mentors, was, what other information was available out there? If there was any. You didn't have any mentors, so for you it's a computer. I know that was the uh, yeah. easy one. I got the computer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as much as, as much as I could like harass Brian and, and Joaquin and go to Pegu and, and ask as many questions and be that annoying person, like the Back in the day, e-gullet, you know, like that was amazing. There was a lot, there were books out there, but not a ton of them. Jeffrey Morgenthaler's blog, e-gullet, like you could actually engage. And Cocktail now, like DD. look at the last year, Cocktail DD, <laughs> whoa. Um, you could, this last year, look at all the books that have come out. Like it's incredible. The amount of resources we have is, is shocking. Absolutely. All right, so, lucky. so I'm going to skip back to the next one because I think this would be more fun. Um, and the fact that uh, I, I ask these, I challenge these guys because the one thing I learned from all of them is, and one statement actually that one said to me was, uh, I learned learn what not to do. So I want you guys all to name like as many three to five things you learned not to do from your mentors. <laughs> uh, who Peter taught start? me to not cheat on my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Bobby, you want to start? Uh, Besides cheating, you don't have a wife, but yeah, I'm not cheating on her. I, I think that when I, to, to not be dismissive of inexperienced people was one thing the 40 person year old bartending crew taught me when I first started working with them because they let me manage the bar when I was 19, which really meant that they let me do all the shitty work that they didn't want to do. But they made me feel good about it, good about it. So it's just like making sure that you, you make everybody feel like they're, they're valuable and don't point out the fact that you're like, there's this huge gap between the fact that they've been doing this for years and that you haven't. So be, be, being inclusive of everybody and not alienating anybody was definitely something. Um, and then I, I learned the lesson about drinking behind the bar. Um, it wasn't necessarily through a mentor as much as it was finding out that I was literally drinking a bottle of some brand represented by Diageo. <laughs> <laughs> every week, uh, or every day when I was working weekend shifts, and uh, then I moved back to Houston after working in Illinois, and I was like, man, I've got to stop doing that. And that was a lesson we learned by ourselves. And then uh, the same guy, I worked for some really shitty people, so here's another story. Um, <laughs> the same guy that, that I had that problem when I was working at bars at, you know, and I was like, oh man, I'm, I'm becoming dependent upon this when I'm working shifts. Um, he also put me in handcuffs when I left and made me pay the $780 in comps that I rang up over two years working in the bar. And I rang Whoa. up all my comps and told me that if I didn't pay for them that he would have his friend take me to jail, right? Whoa. And that so they're- so illegal. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, in addition to learning not to treat people like that, I, I also learned that like, we can't, you can't leave things unclear, ambiguous about how bars operate. And then it's always, always better to just say something so that it's said, right? And so that it's not unclear and so that there is no confusion. Now, he was just a real asshole. But like, <laughs> in trying to even be better than that and learn from the lessons from the people that you worked for who were inept or, or who weren't good bar owners, 
right? They always like kind of reminded me of who I wanted to be when I when I did own my own bar. And I am really glad that I had some really really horrible bar jobs, so I would kind of remember those experiences and know what to do when I owned my own bars. Awesome. Go ahead. And when uh, with Hillary, it was you know it was just about you know, move the mic over. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, not disrespecting the job. You know, don't show plate. Don't wear a dirty shirt. Then there's a list of like a hundred of these things. But it, at the end of the day, if you boil it down, it's just respecting the job. Yeah. Jim, what did you learn not to do? Uh, I, Come I, on, don't, you had a few I honestly, I, I can't really shit talk any of my mentors because I think they were all exemplary. Uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, teaching me the things I learned from them. Um, Chicken. No, no, not at all. I, I really, I, while I have worked for Come on, know, some, something. some people I don't necessarily care for. You don't have to name uh, their names. I, they weren't mentors, so it's, uh, I don't really have, uh, you know, like, I definitely learned uh, from at least one guy that I worked for that, uh, yeah, you, you shouldn't cheat on your spouse and bring that into work and you know, drag your personal life all over work because it definitely, you know, it reflects and uh, it, it, it brings your staff down. Um, Come on, let's be one bar practice that you saw and you're like, you will never do that in your own bar. Um, Whether it's from Sasha to Audrey, I definitely know there's some things there. I know them personally. Uh, can, I, can I just plead the fifth on this one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, I, I would say I would I would actually go back to Bobby's point about uh, treating all staff well and as equally as possible and being as frank as possible about what you expect from them in their jobs. Um, you know, I think that was something I definitely picked up along the way. All right, I'll I'll, I'll let you get off, Alex. <laughs> Uh, uh, here we go. Yeah. Come on, Alex. <laughs> Don't let me down. Uh, I think two important things that early on in my career led me to do things maybe a little differently. One was clarity um, in being clear on what your expectations for people are uh, and setting up systems to help fulfill that goal, right? So, like, if I want you to be the best bartender in New York City, you're working at my bar, um, and I just say, you're, be a great bartender, there's now work behind the bar and don't give you any other information or give you mentorship into that, then how are you going to succeed, right? So there, there is an equal um, relationship with expectation. Um, and when I started out, there was very little. It's like, okay, you're passionate about this? Fantastic. Learn as much as you can. Work a lot, but pretty much go for it. And so that was somewhat successful, but I would have loved to have a little bit more structure. And uh, that, I think, is something we work very hard towards. And I think more importantly than that, though, is the difference between a family and a team. What I really loved about working at some of these bars in the beginning is that it felt like families, that these were people that became my, you know, we worked in the trenches, we went to war together, and like, we are a family. But the problem is, family coddles you. Family tells you you're doing a great job when you're not necessarily doing a great job, and family fights a lot. A team is a different thing. Uh, and yes, there are aspects of family that are really important that I want to integrate, you want to make it personal, and you want to engage with people on a human level, meaning your team, your staff, um, but that a team is produ productive. A team knows how to get shit done. A team knows how to um, push forward as a team and not have the inner conflicts and chaos of a family. Uh, and that's been a really hard lesson to implement because I naturally want our bars to be families, right? I love these people so much. We put so much energy into hiring people that have a certain uh, uh, skill set, sure, but have some sort of personality that shares an affinity with what we love. Um, and so that, I think, is the most important thing. Awesome. Um, that was better. A little more controversial. Not really controversial, but uh, I was hoping for some controversy. You know? <laughs> Just some dirt. Um, but I totally respect you guys. So now you guys, you know, you guys are all bar owners. And you obviously have, you know, you've learned a lot of things from your mentors. Um, and you have some core philosophies behind your own bars. So, um, you know, don't go into it. But for Alex, you know, you, you work on the East Coast as well as the West Coast. And I'm sure each of them have influenced each other. Um, so let's just talk about, like, in brief, 
<laughs> what's the difference? Like, okay. you know, what's the philosophy like between the Death and Company and like a Honeycut or maybe one of your other LA sure. bars? Um, it's kind of like corporate-y to talk about it, but you, do you guys all know who Eric Castro is? Um, very well-known bartender, uh, has Boilermaker in New York as well as um, Flight Provisions in San Diego. And uh, he asked me to do a seminar, I think last year, I don't even remember. Uh, and he, he brought up something, he's been reading a lot of like business books and how to manage people and really expanding outside of the bar world. And one thing that he brought up that was really impactful to me was defining one's core values. Um, this gets like, Again, real corporate real quick, but there, there's a reason why these terms exist. And as we were defining, like, what are the things that make our company tick? What do we care about? What do we value? Quality, uh, hopefully creativity and innovation, uh, hospitality, uh, a list of somewhat nebulous terms. As we were able to do that, we were able to take a step back and say, oh, wow, that thing that is the core of everything that makes Death & Co so special. I didn't create Death & Co. I became an owner not that long ago. Um, but it was all these things that existed within the internal dynamic of it. Those can live in different forms. And that then became incredibly freeing. We could say all those things that define the things that make our bars great can live in a 4,000 square foot nightclub with a light up dance floor. Is that possible? <laughs> Apparently it's possible. And, it, and it's a lot of fun and ridiculous, but hopefully those core values still exist and that they're, they're consistent between the two of them. They're different cities, you know? Uh, New York bars are living rooms there. We, we live in crappy little apartments, presumably. Uh, <laughs> that, <laughs> unless you have a lot of money uh, or some other scenario. Um, we live in these little apartments and we need to go out to bars and, and they're part of our socialization but also part of our comfort and safety net, right? Um, in LA, it's a different story. You need, we, I, I have a, a nice house that doesn't cost anything really in Los Angeles somehow. And I want to stay there, I want to be there. So I'm drawn out to bars and restaurants for different reasons. Some of the same, but you know, the, you need to have a different appeal to people. And I think those differences between the cities have informed what we've done in Los Angeles, but then also returned a little bit to some of the new things we've done in New York, like say Nightcap, which is the size of a postage stamp, but is, is, is a cocktail bar that is plenty ambitious, but also has this tonality of fun to it and ridiculousness that is you know, all, of, it's all of our partner, Natasha, but that there can be different forms and different ways in which to do these things. But the course stays the same. Um, the course hopefully stays the same. <laughs> Bobby, you, I, the one thing I really, the one thing you impressed upon me was the fact that, like, you said, like, you didn't want to take a New York bar and stick it in Houston. You're very proud of the fact that each of your bars have a very unique footprint. So, and that, yeah. What makes what's your philosophy behind all your bars? Well, Anvil is closed right now. We, we are rebuilding Anvil because it's it's literally rotting because we built it ourselves. So it's just time. Like we have to do it, right? So we built the bar for two hundred and thirty thousand dollars, and the bathrooms are falling apart. So like we're at this. <laughs> this moment where we can choose to improve the bar we can choose to leave it the same basically and there are some things about it that i would like to improve like we opened the bar with three wells and now we have five behind the bar but there have been these periods of time where it was like well maybe we'll put servers on the floor or maybe we'll try and do this better or maybe we'll try and improve this aspect of how we make cocktails and charge more money and i think that at the end of the day we run a very very accessible cocktail bar with an average cocktail price below ten dollars Right, We serve a ton of people who walk into the bar every single day. We probably do 600 to 700 covers on a Friday through Saturday. At peak volume, we'll have 200 people in the bar. Right, And it is very much the type of bar that I think represents what Houston is, which is a very, very casual city where you rarely find people dressed to the nines. Right, Your, your oil millionaire will come in in a, in a t-shirt and sit in front of you and everybody is extremely laid back, and I'm really proud of the fact that we run a bar that matches the city that we're from. And so as we're remodeling Anvil, we're trying to fix the things about it that are, are finally starting to give, but I think that, that we've reached this point where we recognize that the bar doesn't belong to us, it belongs to the people that come into it every day. And I think that that's a, that's a core value that we try and have in our, in our bars, is recognizing that it's not necessarily about this arbitrary goal that we we have in our in our in our mind like all the way while still having a purpose and opinions and stuff like that but they're drawn to that purpose and then we we let them exchange with us about how they use the bar what we want the bar to be for them every single day and we're trying to preserve that so i think i think we've reached this point where the bar belongs to all these people that 
that are regulars, all these people that met in the bar and got too liquored up and now have a kid. You know, it's like it's like all these different things, right? I want a book with like all the it's children. The you know, yeah, a bar. yeah. It's like, all the children born. How many of you? I really do. I want like a wall of the children that we've like we've caused to happen through alcohol, right? Like, <laughs> you know, and those are the people that own our bar, and our, we are there every single day to serve them cocktails that we enjoy. You know, from our perspective and with our standards, but we. We are here for Houston. We're not here for anything else. Awesome. Uh, DJ? Uh, so we basically just wanted to open a neighborhood bar where the drinks don't suck. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, this is uh, why I love TJ. He's not complicated. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but also, I mean, al almost more importantly, the, you know, when we were building it and setting it up, we were like, you know, we want to make this an awesome place to work so that, you know, because... Uh, not to totally nerd out, but uh, in Danny Meyer's book, he talks about uh, how we can't treat customers right until we treat ourselves right first. So setting up a bar where everybody wants to work, like everybody who works there is having a good time, they, like, they feel respected, the place isn't falling apart, we're not, at, we're not 86 to everything, we're not like, so they walk into work and they, have a, and they have all the tools they need and they have a good time. So it's a, it's a fun work environment and that translates to the customers too. Awesome. Jim, happiest hour? Uh, well, I mean, there, there. Uh, I, I have opened about 16 bars, I think, at the last count that I did, and uh, I, I now own two of them, but they're two very different models. Um, so happiest hour is meant to be a bar in the sense that a bar was uh, uh, a place to go and sort of uh, either forget or celebrate. Um, and you know, kind of escape uh, the, the 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 tolls of everyday life, um, and it was meant to sort of evoke that sort of mid-century sense of like uh, you go to a bar after work and it's happy hour, and you know, at five o'clock, work is over, your troubles end, and you know, you're sort of like you know, you're gonna have like some good food and some drinks with friends and you know, go home, ideally go home to your family afterwards. Um, and uh, Don't cheat on your wife. <laughs> don't cheat on your wife. I don't know that it's a bad thing we keep repeating this at Tales. So <laughs> happy wife, happy it's a, life. It's a That's a good motto. Delicate tipping point. Um, but uh, yeah, and so the idea was just to have things that were very simple, that everybody liked, that, were, that are easily identifiable, People can read a menu, quickly identify what they want, um, and get it uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a timely manner. Um, so, you know, the program is very streamlined. It's classics that everyone understands. Uh, the signatures are drinks that, uh, you know, have simple flavor profiles that people can easily identify and figure out, okay, I want cucumber, I want that one, you know. So. Uh, just a very accessible, uh, fun bar that people can go to and kind of uh, forget uh, their troubles or... <laughs> or their wife. Or their wife. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Hopefully so let's get into more practical or stuff. Uh, or or and celebrate then slowly, surely downstairs oh, is meant to be uh, more of a craft cocktail bar and more of a haven for people who want to actually come and think about cocktails and flavors and understand ingredients and kind of check out maybe some things that are a little more outside the box. It's very cool. I love that bar. I've only been there once, but I love Thank it. Thank you. Um, sorry, hiring practices, because one of the reasons why I started this <laughs> seminar in the first place is because uh, I started hearing people having some interesting opinions about how they wouldn't hire people from old schools or different schools of thought because they were so rigid about what they believed in that they wouldn't change when they moved to the new bar. That was literally how this entire seminar came to be, because they were just so stuck in their ways and they believed that was the only way that this drink, and I see that a lot with a lot of newbies coming mm -hmm. into the industry, they get so caught up in this like one way and they, you know, they're constantly correcting other, like the more experienced people to know you're wrong, this is the way it should be always. And they're, that's why this panel is put together, because they're so eclectic and everybody has their own different way of doing it, but all very successful and all really well respected people in the industry. So. When it comes to hiring practices, uh, I'd love to ask you guys, you know, do you favor, you know, newbies or old pros, and what's the advantages, and I forget out the word, the disadvantages, there, well, I couldn't forget the word, uh, of hiring one versus the other? Uh, Alex? Uh, I used to 
I, my thoughts on this have shifted dramatically uh, over the course of my career. Uh, at first, I wanted, I think probably for masochism, mostly, I wanted to train people up from scratch uh, and give them and impart my everything I believed. And, and then I reflected on that being incredibly selfish in that I wanted to give somebody my, like my version of cocktails and, and my what I think about them. Um, and then the alternative to that is you know, hiring somebody who is very well established and knows what they're doing um, and you then have trouble uh, corralling them into what you're doing and your vision, right? So uh, I think they're, the challenges of both of those can be solved by training well and having a training program. Um, our bars and our expansion has been incredibly rapid over the last two years to the point that I'm constantly failing to deliver on the promises that I want for our training programs. And uh, right now, my biggest initiative is stepping back from the way in which we do everything and not saying, I hire a certain type of person, but say, what are the attributes of our finest employees that we love, we value, both personality characteristics and the things that they do on a daily basis, very small things that, that are successful that we find valuable, and then work backwards from there. And define everything that we love and say, how can we get to that conclusion? And that then is starting to develop into not only the training systems, uh, but all the way down to what we ask on that first interview to try and get to that end result. And I don't know why it took me 10 years to figure that out. We'll see if it <laughs> succeeds or fails. So um, to answer your question, actually, uh, uh, either one, uh, because it's up to me to make sure that what I'm doing and where I, the, the core being of this bar and the program is clear enough that somebody can meet those expectations. Oh, just so you know, this is the, um, the Good Love cocktail, which was TJ's cocktail, um, which is made with Tanqueray gin, lemon juice, spice wine syrup, and a dash of pastry bitters, and Gary Regan's orange bitters. Mm. It's very complicated for Mother's yeah. Room. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty... Uh, <laughs> um, it, has, it has more than two ingredients. Yeah, more than two ingredients. Who knew that? Um, so, um, Alex, sorry, did I cut you no, off? I'm done. Okay. Uh, Bobby, do you have a thought about... I don't know how many of you guys are basketball fans, right? That's the round one? That's the, like, <laughs> it's the round, it's the round one, right? The tan one. All right. I've hated the LA Lakers ever since. They took Shaquille O'Neal. They took Shaquille O'Neal, Carl Malone. You guys will hate this team, too, if you'll let me finish, right? Shaquille O'Neal. Kobe Bryant, Karl Malone, and Gary Payton, and they put them all on the same team, and they tried to buy a championship, and they lost to the Detroit Pistons with a team that nobody knew at the time, with Ben Wallace and Rasheed Wallace and Chauncey Billups, okay? Right? And even if you don't know who all these people are, we just had this collection of four superstars, and then we had this other team that fit together better, right? And that's how you hire for a bar, right? When you interview people, we interview them to fit into the team that we have in place. If we lose someone, we're trying to fill in that balance, right? And it doesn't mean that I'm going to hire the, the absolute best bartender. I'm going to hire someone that I think makes our team the very, very best. And so for me, sometimes that means that we hire people that have virtually no experience. Because you know what's great about people who have no experience is that they unite all the veterans around them, right? They become these little projects that kind of unites the team and says, let's take care of our current person is Weston. Let's take care of Weston, right, at Anvil. It's like we've... Let's all pick on him from time to time and make fun of the fact that he's 21 and learning how to drink, and, but we're still gonna turn him into a bartender, right? And it's this very unifying thing that's happening with the staff right now. And then at other times we get a little too immature, so we really need to find someone that has better instincts where you don't have to tell them, hey, don't say things like that to guests, right? And that's how, that's how we choose to hire as, <laughs> that's how we choose to hire as best we can, you know? <laughs> um, but you know, when we, when we hire people, we, we work in a talent pool that has less experience on the whole than other cities across the country as it relates to cocktail bars. So we really have to focus on training. We go through a 12-week training process where you, you get a chance to pass that week's training. And if you don't make it, you have to retest next week. And it's nine months long. So we're also more comfortable with the idea of hiring people that don't have experience because we have such a regimented manner in which we train people.
Awesome. So guys, I'm not going to ask you. Do you have anything? Okay, good. I'm going to skip over just a few things because I want, there's a few things before we run out of time that I think is really kind of poignant. Like media practices. Because this is something, this is a day and age of social media. And this is a day and age of star tenders. And there's a lot of different controversy about this. So, but before I start that, TJ, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because you had a very interesting uh, practice about when you opened Mother's Rune about the media. Yeah, we, you know, we opened a, a, a very small bar in a neighborhood uh, that's pretty busy already. And you know, legally, we hold 74 people. So we didn't really, <laughs> yeah, legally. <laughs> um, uh, but we didn't really feel like we needed, you know, 11 million people to know about the bar. So like, you know, and, and plus we didn't want to, we didn't want to blow up at the beginning and like get caught with our pants down. So we want to kind of start slow and kind of like build the business. So we just decided if any way we could, we would squash any sort of press. Like, I mean, got, granted, you know, you can't stop bloggers, you can't stop people from doing that. But as far as any other traditional media, things that we can control, we decided we just weren't going to do it. And it turned out to work wonders. <laughs> Which is unusual, because most people want to get most press as end. Right, but it's all, it's all like, like understanding your target market. It's like, you know exactly who is going to be sitting that, in that chair, and the more you know about them, you know, that, like, you know how to get them. And it, whether that's word of mouth, industry, word of mouth, you know, whatever, or they're in the neighborhood. And then it's almost like you, you know your target market and you don't want to like, infect it with other markets. So you're almost like kind of disrespecting your regulars by like, all right, I'm busy now, but if I blow this up with some crazy ad campaign, I can get tons more people in here. So that's why it's, it's always like, like four months after someplace opens, then, then all your friends go, yeah, you know what, I used to go there, but like, all these crazy people there now. <laughs> you know, because you're just trying it to jam everybody in there. You know? Yeah, I, I definitely just, agree. Yeah. I, that's why we love going to your bar. It's busy, just busy enough. It's just busy enough. Just busy enough. So, Alex, I think because I thought you had a very interesting perspective on this. When your mentors opened bars, there was no social media. Um, but since that time, it's become very important. And you have a very interesting philosophy about like promoting your individual people at your bars. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's based upon being. As an owner and operator now, um, I started out as a bartender, right? And you work with people that uh, inspired you, sure. But uh, where I started, really at Death & Co, though elsewhere, um, the core kind of idea behind attention there was that if it's your product, you get credit for it. Stand out in front of it. You should always take credit for it. And because Phil was making the vast majority of drinks, Phil got most of the attention. And he was the head bartender and was teaching us a lot. But the moment that we uh, had a menu tasting, my first menu tasting there, where we're presenting drinks to each other and working on them and then designing the menu, like it was fully expected that, that was like week two I was working there. Like, okay, your turn, come up, bring some drinks. What are you contributing to this menu? So the idea of contribution was really important. So that set the standard for all of our bars. And I just like, I don't understand how I can take credit for other people's work. Like that just doesn't, that's crazy to me. Um, but at the same time, it's balancing that with having some sort of identity that, that gets the attention. You know, like the editors of the New York Times know of Death & Co and know of a couple of people's names, so they want to plug that when sometimes it's somebody else's product. And it's a really hard balance to try to finagle in. Uh, my partner in LA, Devin Tarby, who is a co-owner of one of our new properties, uh, the Normandy Club and uh, the Walker Inn, she uh, is, it, we're constantly, very methodically trying to make sure that the attention is given to her for a lot of this product, even though we develop a lot of it together, simply for credit's sake, you know, it's, it's accurate, it's the reality. I don't really so even though you're the owner, you're, you step back so that you individual people, did you ever get people like back, is it just, if, does the press always have to go to an owner operator? Meaning like Natasha at Nightcap, but what about like if you have a star bartender? Because sometimes I know that can be backlash because then that bartender leaves and then they sure. go someplace else. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it, it, that's such a strange scenario for me because I mean, to, for somebody to that would be a personality flaw to me. Like I would, I don't think we would hire the type of person. Hopefully, anyway, that would like grab all the attention and then just move on. Like that would be that would be my failure. In, Okay. <laughs> I just know it's up. Jim, do you have any? Uh, I mean, it, it's tough because as an owner operator, uh, you know, you do draw a lot of press personally. But you know, one thing I really try to do at Slowly Surely was kind of put our cocktails, our house cocktails, into a continuum. So we have a classics list where we credit 
uh, both uh, kind of antiquarian and contemporary uh, bartenders with their drinks that are variations on certain types of drinks. And then so as a, as a sort of uh, a, an offshoot of that, um, every drink on the menu is credited with its creator. Uh, so basically like, uh, you know, like my bartender Garrett, you know, has uh, drinks on the menu that are credited to him uh, for the simple reason that he made them up and I feel like that should be something that's acknowledged and I don't want to be the uh, bar owner who, you know, sort of gets all the press for having these great drinks on the menu and doesn't say, well, this is actually the guy that made this drink up. Um, so. It was very important to me to sort of give that credit to my team. Um, and at the same time, you know, I don't want, like, I don't necessarily like, you know, I don't want people on social media while they're at work, obviously, you know, promoting themselves um, and kind of, you know, doing the star tender thing in that way. But I do think that giving credit where credit's due is very important. Bobby? Um, I think that we ask a lot of people who choose to bartend behind cocktail bars. Like I could go work at a nightclub right now and make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, right? You just you just go do it. Like if you want to, if you're good at it, you can go do it right now, right? So I think that the one thing that we try and do for our staff is, we we try to pay them well, and I think that they're paid very well for for their jobs and their positions. But I also think that we're asking them to sacrifice for this specific part of the industry, and I think that in doing so, we we have to give them assets that they that they then walk away from the bars with. So we try and do that with training and education and a lot of transparency in our company. But we also try and tag our bartenders on social media as much as we can, right? And try and help them develop regulars and help them develop a way to stay in touch with those regulars when they move on in their careers, right? And I think that for us, that's a way of, of giving them assets back. And I think that that's an important part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So like even when we posted our new cocktail menu for Anvil, we tagged every single bartender on social media. And it's almost like if you don't, we encourage social media pretty heavily in our company because it's a really good way to get people to come into bars in a city that's less dense, right? So, I mean, every single one of our uh, bartenders at Anvil has an Instagram account, so we can tag them on the Instagram account. So, but then we build every single concept around a central person and a central figure. So every single establishment from our bars to our restaurants has one person that is the owner and the operator, and the rest of us will not even comment on the media about those establishments so that their voice is accurate and it's heard, and all of us, in our cooperative way are just trying to help that person execute their perspective and their personality. So that's how we view ownership and how we handle ownership issues and then how we handle social media for individual employees. Great. Um, so these are some fun things, things that make the old regime cringe, things that we all kind of learned when we first started and like we heard, you know, rumors. Vodka. <laughs> it's definitely, so like Jim, you had a great philosophy. You were like, why, why did the old, old regime, like the ones that originally carried it, like, not carry it? To me, uh, the, the vodka thing was really just uh, all of us trying to get consumers to uh, wake up to other spirits and become receptive to them. Um, and that was really how it started. I mean, in my opinion, there, there wasn't, you know, necessarily a hatred of vodka. It was just like... 10 years ago, a bar would be, a, you'd walk in and you would see 30 different flavored vodkas on the back bar and like one gin, one, <laughs> one bourbon, one scotch, uh, you know, I mean, and like, that was kind of how a bar was set up. So uh, really in the beginning, it was just kind of an effort to say, here are other spirits, here is how they play in cocktails. It doesn't always have to be vodka or some flavored variation on that spirit. It can be a lot of different things and they all contribute different things to drinks. Um, and I think the reason that, so that war has sort of ended is because we, frankly, I think we won it. Um, <laughs> it honestly, I, I run a bar, Happiest Hour, where we allow guests their choice of four spirits in all of our signature drinks. Vodka is one of those four spirits for every single drink. Um, I don't find that the majority of guests order vodka. Frankly, I see more Applejack, more gin, more bourbon. Um, I, I, there isn't a lot of, you know, can I get that with vodka? And I think, I think you're right. I mean, we sell more gin than we do vodka. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, I sell 
at least four cases of Dorothy Parker gin a week plus one case of beef eater a week. Tangeray. Tangeray. And Tangeray. Lots of Tangeray. Sorry. But I mean, it's, the, the volume uh, of gin that I go through, while well, certainly cards. vodka, yeah. you know, vodka does pay the bills, the volume of vodka that I go, go through is a nowhere near the volume of other spirits. You see my sponsor table point. over there? It's a Sorry lynch mob. Just yeah. for the record, we actually sell four cases of Tanqueray a week. We do just for the record. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Just so, bought a case of Tanqueray. Thank, and thank you. Um, so, uh, Alex, you had an interesting <laughs> thing about why you think people are drinking. Like, it, there was a misnomer about, like, people hating it for... Yeah, this goes back to, we were talking about, like, mentorship and I keep harping on the power of it, right? And uh, there without really much structure, we learn from the people that we work for, and we repeat the same things that they say. And for a very long time, there was a canned line about like vodka being uh, without flavor and useless because craft cocktails that vodka didn't exist, and these old recipes are, you know, the old these, the spirits contribute more flavor. And uh, it, it was a very quick way of describing it. And so this just got repeated over and over to the point where a couple years ago, like have a conversation with somebody and and suddenly, like, vodka is evil. Like, this category of spirit is somehow evil, and the people that make it are bad people, and that's fucking <laughs> ludicrous, right? Like, it's, it's alcohol. It's the it, same thing can be said about a lot of shit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that kind of moment, that was a big revelation for me last year. It was like, oh, wait, step back from that. I'm just repeating the same thing people are saying to me. And it's not just the vodka conversation. That's just one part of it. We just keep on repeating some of the same things over and over again without really digging into it and, and having a, a unique perspective on it. So um, in that way, I think vodka just is simply a metaphor for um, the lack of overall conversation within this industry um, and deep deep passion, passionate education about everything that we're using. Absolutely. Well, TJ, you sum it up. Why do you carry vodka? I asked you, you carry vodka. Oh, it's booze, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're at a bar? <laughs> yeah, you carry it. Best line yet. Slushy machines. Yes. Yeah. Oh. Now, they're all clapping over there because TJ in New York was probably the first person to put a slushie in, in, his, in his bar. And, and TJ, tell him, why do you use the slushie? Keeps the liquor room clean. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, don't you? <laughs> if we could have a bigger slushie machine, I you definitely need to, would. Yeah, you need to move anything, put it in a slushie machine. <laughs> So I think we can all agree we like slushies. And Bobby said to me, I couldn't have a can. I mean, if, if, we had, if we had a mezcal and tequila focus bar without a frozen margarita in Houston, Texas, they would call the police. I would just be like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like everybody's first taste of alcohol is a sip off mom or dad's frozen margarita. It's like a birthright, you know? It's just like, <laughs> that's how it is. Absolutely. All right. So. Batching. Now, you guys all have different thoughts about this. So, uh, uh, Bobby, I'll start with you because you have a more purist style of it. Uh, we do everything one at a time and we don't batch anything except for the frozen margarita. So, um, now part of that is because I, I like making everything in front of guests, but the other part of it is that we work in a really weird state where all of our alcohol has a specific stamp on it. And I can't do those cool little cheater bottles that you guys have. Like when I want to use Benedictine, I've got to grab that awkward bottle. bottle of Benedictine and I've got to use it, right? And um, so that, that makes things more challenging for us. And so for us, you know, there, there isn't a lot of batching that we're legally allowed to do. And they come in all the time, decked out in cowboy sheriff outfits and guns and look at the stamps on our liquor bottles on Friday at 1 a.m. when we're four deep, uh, which is awesome. Yeah, so it's, for us, it's, it's kind of regulated by state laws. But we find ways to work around it and do the best that we can in every situation. And that's just kind of how that goes, so yeah. Awesome. Yeah. TJ? Well, I mean, we're not opposed to it. I mean, we batch the slushy every day, but uh, we just kind of just don't in general. We don't really feel a need. We have, it's a small room. Yeah, so that means that you don't have to. Do you, do you batch, Jim? Uh, the entire cocktail program upstairs at Happiest Hour is based on batching and having sort of like the base ingredients for a drink batched, and then the guests choose the spirit, and we're able to just pour it very quickly, uh, shake or stir it, and have it out. What would Audrey um, say about that? What's up? What would, what would Sasha say about that? 
Uh, I don't. I, he's, he he <laughs> likes the drinks. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's come in and enjoyed himself a few times. times. Uh, I, I, I don't know what he would say about the actual practice. We've never really uh, discussed that fully. Um, downstairs, we have a menu that has. Uh, it's going to have eventually. We just opened about a month and a half ago. We're going to have eventually about 50 odd drinks on the menu. And there's only so much rail space for all of that. So at a point, you do have to use cheater bottles. And you do have to batch ingredients together. And that's just the reality of running uh, you know, a cocktail bar and uh, you know, having a lot of really cool ingredients on your menu um, to produce great drinks. And to see, you, can't, you can only fit so many things in a rail and on a back bar. And it's Audrey, actually, she did batching as well, didn't she? She, I think she was the, she was the person that taught me how to batch. She was the person that taught me that if you, uh, you know, if you macerate mint into a batch, you don't have to shake mint into a drink. You can, you know, batch all these things together and just sort of pour a cocktail and shake it and have it out that much faster, which was kind of the goal on uh, weekends at Tegu. So awesome, Alex, good. Uh, batching exists for us in multiple forms. Um, the most traditional is simply to speed up service so that we can, our bartenders can engage with, with humans more um, and uh, to make, get those drinks out quicker. Great. Uh, we also have a number of programs that have draft cocktails. Um, so they're large batches that we're doing something with. But what's really exciting to me is that through the process of developing um, a draft, massive draft cocktail program at Honeycut, as well as playing with carbonation on an individual cocktail level with other bars, is that when we started playing with these large batches and tweaking them on a macro level, we somehow found that we created something unique that can never be reproduced in a single serving glass anymore. So we could, not created, but began to define a whole different category. So batching to us is very valuable thing at some points because we're able to, say, put a, just a little drop, uh, like what would be the equivalent of one gram of salt solution into a single serving drink, but on a large level it has a different impact. So that's, to me, very exciting because I get to work in New York and Los Angeles where I have none of those restrictions that Bobby has to deal with. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm going to skip that one. I know drinking on job is fun, but we're going to go in because we're running out of time. Free pouring versus jiggering. Bobby? We jigger everything. Yeah. yeah. TJ? You guess. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's you on the bottom left. I will say, I will say here that the first time I had a show, the first time I had a shift behind a bar with this guy, it was at uh, Mary Queen of Scots, the, the late great. And I looked at him and I was like, well, this is a, a, a historic first, isn't it? And uh, so we started working and uh, immediately I was like, holy fucking shit, I've got to do something to make myself faster. Because I just watched TJ, it was like, he was a beast, you know, just like hunkered down, uh, free pouring everything and completely accurately. And uh, I think bars kind of speak to whether or not they are free pour bars, frankly. Uh, you know, like I've worked rooftop bars where, you know, it's always free pour. Um, and obviously at uh, my you know, cocktail bar downstairs, I would never allow someone to free pour. So it, it just depends on the bar. Alex, for all your bars, you have different policies? Uh, they're, they're different everywhere. But at the core of it, I think, is uh, you know, with, with cocktails, cocktails I, I find, find a lot of value in a measurement tool. Um, right. At the same, same time, though, um, I think teaching both is incredibly important no matter what your policy is. So uh, I uh, had, with, had a text exchange with a guy named Al Sotak uh, yesterday, and he was at a bar uh, in Brooklyn, uh, Donna, and one of my head bartender at Nightcap was there, and he poured. He was pouring some shots, and they were uneven. And Al took a picture of it because I worked with Al opening up the Franklin Morgan Investment in Philadelphia, and we had something during training, which was mostly an excuse just to drink a little bit on the job. But it was we would do a free pour competition, and we would free pour cocktails to see and, and taste them side by side, and who did better at it. And I found it was such a valuable thing. And he sent me that, and he's like, what the hell are you teaching them these days? This guy doesn't even know how to pour some shots evenly. 
So there is value in it, right? Like if you're in a scenario, no matter what type of bar you're in, there's always a need to be able to accurately pour out of a bottle. And if you don't have that skill, gain that skill. It's not that hard, just take yeah, practice. I require about 90% accuracy minimum from all yeah. <laughs> We only have about five minutes left. So uh, ice. Um, I, I put this up there because obviously ice has become a big thing, and uh, Sasha kind of started the whole ice craze and about how he felt about ice. So Bobby, I'll start with you. I worked a shift recently where three of our bartenders cut themselves in the middle of it. Right? It was awesome. It was on a Friday night, right in the middle of the rush. We run four bartenders behind the bar. Um, I'm not giving them chainsaws. Like it's just that's just a horrible idea. They're gonna have mass casualties and stuff like that. Like I don't know. I, I don't. I, I think really cool ice is cool and everything. If that's your thing, we run a really casual bar. We have good ice because it makes good drinks. When we open the bar, we could afford an okay ice machine. It costs two hundred thirty thousand dollars to open the bar. When we made more money, we bought a new ice machine. Right. That's. That's what we got, you know, and I, I think it just depends on the bar that you're running and the type of execution that you're trying to pull off and the price point you're serving cocktails at and how important it is to, to have perfect cues or fast service. So, yeah. Ask TJ what he said. <laughs> Do you have a special ice for him? No, I've, I've, worked, I've worked at bars with every type of ice. I worked at Prime Meats where they have chip ice and still made great cocktails there. Uh, I currently, you know, have uh, a 500 pound cold draft, a thousand pound cold draft, a Scotsman, and I buy 100 weight ice. So, I mean, I think it's important, but at the end of the day, I think a good drink is a good drink. Alex, anything to add? Uh, I, I, only to add on top of what these guys have said, uh, ice can be another opportunity to engage your guests and to, um, I don't know, say that you, you're caring about your product. So if I serve somebody an old-fashioned on a beautiful crystal clear piece of ice that cost me way too much money to buy from Eric Alperin, uh, it, uh, so much money. Uh, that, that piece of ice, and the simple act of choosing that and being conscious of that detail in there says something to my guests. Um, yes, there's a qualitative reason why that's happening, but it's as much, uh, it is an aesthetic decision as well. You know, that is beautiful. That drink is beautiful from start to finish because of that. Um, so th they're just different tools for different reasons, right? We, uh, one of our bars uh, in New York 151 is a slightly reimagined dive bar, and like we have the little shell version of Cold Draft, and it's awesome. And it applies and it works because that is that place. All right, since we only have two minutes left, I, I'm going to skip over to the rest of the minute. But we'll end on a positive note. <laughs> Um, so, so what advice do you get, who, where do you get your advice these days, you know, who, where's it from, the mentors, Facebook, your parents, you know, who's your source? Uh, we have eight places now, Anvil is six and a half years old, and my biggest mentor is David Ciro, I don't know if you know David Ciro, you don't see him Brazil tequila. Um, I call him like my dad in this industry. Uh, so he owns San Brazil Tequila, and he also runs a restaurant in Philadelphia called Tequilas, which is one of the best restaurants in Philadelphia. And I just want to do that with Anvil, right? So for me, I'm less interested in what like the new, crazy, cool, barrel-aged, whatever program people are doing, and I'm more interested in how do you have people that work for you for 20 years, that love their jobs every single day, and that many regulars. That's what I want to do with my career. Uh, I usually ask Toby Maloney first, because he always has the greatest responses to any question. And then, uh, and then I ask my buddy Tom Wilson. He, uh, he's owned a bunch of places, some fantastic restaurants like Moss Farmhouse, uh, Reunion. He's done everything. I mean, he's like some crazy renaissance man. He like motorcycle from Mongolia. He used to hang off the side of cliffs and drill holes in for bridges. Yeah, he was a chef. He was a playwright. You know, like, he just knows everything. We call him the, the world's most inter interesting man. But you know, you go to, so between him and Toby, there, there isn't a question that they don't know. The answer. I, I really, for me, it's kind of all around. I, I, people that I've worked with for a long time, uh, you know, family, 
uh, people who used to be my managers who now come to me, come to my bar, and I, I, I just kind of like run them through all the questions I have or concerns I have about running my business, you know, that week. Uh, and uh, I, I try to take away as much as I can from everyone around me because it's, they, they all have so much, you know, to teach. Uh, as my career has moved from behind the bar to running bars, um, I looked to different sources outside of the bar industry, and probably most dramatically, uh, my family, my dad, is a successful businessman, owns his own business, and has for years. And so, when I have questions of management and how do you, what what does accounting mean? I don't understand. Uh, what payroll? Interesting. Uh, he usually has. Uh, at least good guidance. Um, so he and my older brother, who also owns his own business, are, are hugely impactful. But it's uh, this community as a whole is so uh, open to sharing. This is such an open source group of people throughout the world, and it's so hard to explain to people that aren't in this industry how amazingly open advice is across the board. And I think it's true. I'd love to, you could name anyone really, and they've been somehow helpful to me. And most dramatically, when I call someone, it's usually Eric Castro, uh, it's Joaquin Bryan, uh, Phil sometimes. <laughs> uh, and it's everyone. He picks up. Yeah. But uh, more than that, my partners. Uh, we all have unique perspectives, and that, that's part of what I think hopefully distinguishes us. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I've, uh, just to end that note, the one thing I've, I know, I'm getting the countdown, but uh, the one thing that I've learned in this industry, and I'm sure most of you can attest to, is that I've learned, because I had such a diverse background coming into this, was if you're willing to learn and do the work, somebody is willing to teach you. And it's so true. Like, it really is. I'm sure you guys, I hope you guys have experienced it.